Well, good morning. morning. He is risen. risen Amen. Amen. Well, this is our Resurrection Sunday morning service. And I know that there are, are some who are visiting. And if you don't have a Bible, and I know that they're not underneath every chair, but you would like one, please raise your hand. We'll make sure to get one to you. Um, so if you'd, li- if you'd like one and you don't have one with you, please raise your hand. One of our ushers will make sure to, to get one into your, your fingers. Well, I've titled this morning's message, The Resurrection, Ascension, and Exaltation of Jesus Christ. That's what we're here to worship. And we're here to worship God and we're here to celebrate that this morning. What I want to do is begin with an article that I read. It was in the Christian Post by a gentleman named Jerry Newcomb. The Post was in 2011, but it says this. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the greatest fact in human history. Yet throughout the centuries to our present time, skeptics skeptics have argued against the historical reliability of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Recently, well-known atheist Richard Dawkins said, Accounts of Jesus' resurrection and ascension are about as well documented as Jack and the Beanstalk. About this, author Rene Lopez said this about Dawkins' notion that the resurrection of Jesus is as historical as Jack and the Beanstalk. And he says, The Gospels are more reliable accounts in ancient history than any other document we have before, the, before and after. Dr. Sam... Lamerson of Knox Theological Seminary says this, there are so many pieces of evidence for the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that if we reject the truth of the resurrection, I believe we must then become total historical agnostics and reject virtually everything that we know about ancient history. According to Lamerson, there is no ancient historical event that is more certainly testified to both by number of witnesses and by evidence than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This morning's message is not an apologetic. It's not to attempt to assure you on the historical fact of the resurrection. It is historical and it is a fact. There's really no denying it if we're to look at the evidence. The denying, the denying it simply would happen in our own minds. But what we're going to talk about today is the blessings that Christians receive as they put their hope in a living Christ, as they put their hope in the risen Christ, Jesus, not only in his resurrection and especially not in his, just in his death, but also in his ascension and exaltation. Now, what I want to do this morning is sort of step back and give you just a a brief glimpse at the life of Christ, and then we're going to do, jump into the point of this morning. But you can really sum up the life of Jesus in really three eras of his life. First, his birth and his silent years. Now, this was around a 30-year period, more or less. This includes his birth, his infancy, his childhood, his adolescence, adolescence, and his early adult life. And then you also have his public presentation, Jesus' public presentation lasted for two and a half years. It includes things like his baptism, his temptation, his first miracle at Cana when he turned water to wine. It includes his earthly Judean ministry, the cleansing of the temple, his conversation with Nicodemus, and his ministry to the woman at the well. It also includes his later Galilean ministry. Jesus here performed many miracles and his ministries, or his ministry rather, focused on the Jewish people. But at the end of this time, there was a switch. This was the beginning of his private presentation, really his private ministry. At this time, Jesus focused specifically on 12, 12 men who we come to find later were so devoted to the Messiah that they were willing to die. Prior to this time, to the the private presentation, Jesus was seeking crowds. Now, he was seeking privacy. Jesus used to work many miracles, 
But now he was seeking to avoid miraculous deeds and began to speak in riddles called parables. Prior to this time, he was traveling throughout Jewish lands and now he travels through non-Jewish territories. Jesus also traveled to Jerusalem three times, but for two Jewish feasts, for the Jewish feast of tabernacles as well as the Jewish feast of dedication. And then he went to Bethany to raise his dear friend Lazarus from the dead. The final era of Jesus' life is in his final days, his final events. This lasted 47 days. During these final days, Jesus experiences the Passion Week. He experiences his resurrection, his ascension, and his exaltation. This is the life of Christ. The ministry of Christ lasted really no more than about three and a half years. In a matter of three and a half years, he turned the world upside down. In a matter of three and a half years, he established a core group of men that were going to bring the gospel throughout the world. They were going to change the world as it was known at the time. And in fact, as you know, he changed our world. And if you sit here today and you know and trust Christ as your savior, he changed your life. He changed your life. And not just the things that you do and the words that you say, but he changed you from the inside out. That's what salvation is. Salvation is an inward transformation. And that inward transformation changes the way we think, changes the things we do, changes the things that we say. We are not saved by good deeds. We are not saved by being a kind person. We are not saved by reading our Bibles. We're not even saved by being baptized. But we're saved because of a finished work of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago because of what he accomplished on that cross. But what we can't forget is the gospel isn't just what was accomplished on the cross. The gospel is what was accomplished on the cross, before the cross, in Jesus' sinless life, and after the cross, in his resurrection and his ascension. John 21, 25 says, there are other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, we suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that could be written. What Jesus did in a matter of three and a half years, we could write volumes and volumes and volumes. Much more be could be said about our Savior. But this is all that God has given us, what he has given us in, this, in his word. All that we have is written right here. This is all that we need. This book is sufficient. Amen. It is not only a sufficient record, all that we've been given in Christ, all that we've been given with the work of God, with the spirit in our lives, is sufficient for a life of godliness, Peter tells us. And all that we need to know about why we are here today, the resurrection is found right here in God's word. Now, today, my desire is that we will really see beyond the facts. We have to understand the facts at some level, but we, I want us to see beyond the facts that we can fo focus on the blessings of what the resurrection, what the ascension, and what the exaltation bring to us. What does it mean? What does it mean in our everyday lives? What does it mean when we lose a loved one? What does it mean during the struggles and difficulties of just everyday life? What does it mean in our everyday conflicts? What does it mean in our marriage relationships? Does it matter? Does the resurrection of Christ matter? in regard to the things that we view on television or, or the way that we interact with individuals, I would say that it does. 
What I want to talk about first is the resurrection. What we need to first understand about the resurrection is the resurrection is not resuscitation. It is not simply breathing life into a dead body like CPR. The mere res restoration of life to a, to a corpse, that is not resurrection. A person who has resuscitated returns only to this earthly life to then one day in the future to die again. That is not resurrection. Resurrection, in the words of one theologian, is this, the transformation of a corpse into a living, supernatural body, and as such, is to be sharp, sharply distinguished from the resuscitation of the dead individual to the ordinary pre-mortem state of life. As you might know, there were many who were resuscitated but only one who was resurrected. Some of those who were resuscitated, one is the widow of Zareth's son. He was raised by Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17. The Shunammite's woman's son was raised by Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 4. A man, when he came into contact with the bones of Elisha, he was resuscitated in 2 Kings chapter 13. Dorcas was raised by Peter in Acts 9. Eutychus was raised by Paul in Acts 20. The widow of Nain's son was raised by Jesus in Luke 7. Jairus' daughter was raised by Christ in Luke 8. And Lazarus, of course Lazarus, was raised by Jesus in John 11. All of these individuals they were resuscitated, but they were not resurrected. Resurrection is something far different. The resurrection is identified as an act of power by a triune God. God the Father raised the Lord through his pow power according to Acts, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 14. God the Son was resurrected I'm sorry, God the Son tells us that his body will be destroyed, but he has been given the authority and power to raise it up again in John 2.19 and in John 10.17 and 18. And in fact, the Holy Spirit plays a part as well in the res resurrection. The work of the Spirit was actually a commissioning of God the Father that he raised Christ from the dead in Romans 8. The result of true resurrection it brings about something entirely new. It brings about something that the world hasn't seen before. The resurrection body had similar similarities to our natural bodies, but differences. I just want to explain to you some of those similarities. One, well, in, in Luke 2, 24, 39, and in John 20, we are told that Jesus, in his resurrected body, he had hands, he had feet, he was made of flesh and blood. We are also to told that the wounds that he received on the cross remained with him. They were evidences of something new, but yet not entirely changed. Luke 24, 30, verse 42 and 43 informs us that Jesus in his resurrected body, he could eat. Luke 24, 31 tells us that although Jesus had a real body, it was unlike our natural bodies. Jesus had the ability in this new body to appear and to disappear. He had the ability to travel long distances in a moment's time. Luke 24 tells us about this. Some of the disciples came to the empty tomb. They were bewildered. They were staggered. If you remember the scene, they had no idea, or at least they did not, it did not, come to their mind that there was going to be a risen Christ. They, when Jesus died, they were destroyed. Some of those who were confused and bewildered, as they traveled to Emmaus, Jesus met them on the road. The disciples did not recognize him, and in fact, they were kept from recognizing the Christ. 
Jesus explained many things to them, but it wasn't until they stopped to eat together that in verse 33 of Luke, it says this, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Do you remember what happened next? He disappeared. He vanished. He was gone. He vanished from their sight. And these disciples immediately left and went to Jerusalem. When they got to Jerusalem, they realized Christ has already been here. Cephas, Peter, he already knows. The disciples already know. What they saw in the resurrected body, they saw something that was normal. They saw something that was familiar. But they also saw something that was miraculous. This convinced them in verse 34 that the Lord has really risen. They were convinced. The most detailed explanation of a resurrected body is found for us in 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to ask you to turn there with me. 1 Corinthians 15. This, is, this chapter by far, again, is the most de detailed explanation of the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15. Look at verse 50 with me, please. Here, Paul writes, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, sleep here being a euphemism for death, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. Now, what is Paul saying? What's his point only those who have resurrected bodies can inherit the kingdom of God. All church age believers, Christians, will receive glorified bodies. Those with resurrected bodies will be then unable to die. They will then be unable to age. They will then be unable to grow ill or have disease and then it will be an impossible for them to receive injury. Some of you I know cannot wait Amen. for that body. Amen. But we must wait. But it is a promise. For those who know Christ... This is what you have to look forward to. This is the blessing. This is one of the many blessings Amen. of a resurrected Savior. The resurrected body is far more than a resuscitated body. The resurrected body appears to all that a normal body does, yet without the limitations, without the multitudes of limitations. When Jesus rose to eternal life, he took on a radically transformed body that can be described as immortal, glorious, powerful, supernatural, and indeed incorruptible. Jesus, in this new mode of his existence, was not bound by the physical limitations of this universe, but possessed superhuman abilities. And the characteristic of our Lord's resuscitated, I'm sorry, his resurrected body are the characteristics of our future glorified bodies. Look at Romans 8 with me. Romans 8 verse 11. Halfway through this passage, Paul says to the church in Rome, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies 
through his spirit who dwells in you. That's a promise. Just listen, Colossians 1.18, speaking of Jesus, says, He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Did you hear that? Jesus is what? He's the beginning. He's the firstborn from the dead. To be a beginning means there has to be some sort of continuation. To be a firstborn implies that there's probably going to be more to follow. That's good, ne- good news for you, saints. Jesus' body was in its glorified state as the prototype. We too will benefit from that glorified body. For 40 days, Jesus traversed Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. Between the Gospels and 1 Corinthians 15, we are told that he appeared to Mary Magdalene and a group of other women, to two disciples on the Emmaus Road, to Cephas, and then to the 11 disciples of Jerusalem, to James, his half-brother. He appeared to seven disciples fishing, to 11 disciples in Galilee, and then to 500 others at one time. It was after all this that Jesus departed from this world and our Savior was received into heaven. This is the ascension. This is the exaltation. And I want to encourage you, saints, from this day forward, as you think about the ascension, as you hear someone talk about the ascension, I want you to also include the exaltation. When we think of the resurrection, we do not often consider the ascension and the exaltation. But they are very important aspects of this most essential work of Christ. The resurrection, the ascension, and the exaltation will prove to us and to the world that God the Father was pleased with the atoning work of God the Son. And the imparting of the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, is further proof proof of God's pleasure. The ascension and the exaltation is the essentially one event in Scripture. Turn with me to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. As the physician tells us about the ascension, in verse 50 of Luke 24, he says this. Jesus, and he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands, and he blessed them, speaking of his disciples. While he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they, the disciples, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising God. Now, Again, be reminded of the scene here. We have these disciples who gave everything to follow the Messiah. He died, and they were, again, distraught. They were overwhelmed. They were were discouraged. It was the ascension that, and obviously 40 days with with the glorified Christ, that reminded them what is to come. Acts chapter 1 Verses 9 through 11 also give us a little bit more on the ascension. Acts chapter 1, verse 9. And after he had said these things, again speaking of Jesus, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Verse 10 says, And as they were gazing intently into the sky, while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. It's interesting to hear angels talk to men because they always talk to them as if it's, duh, what are you doing? Why are you still here? Why are you standing with your mouth 
gaping, looking foolishly into the sky. Get to work. He's going to come again. And then speaking of our Savior's exaltation. Just listen. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. Just listen. I pray, Paul says, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. This, saints, is the exaltation. He was raised with power. He is seated at God the Father's right hand in the heavenly places. His work is done. He is far above all rule and authority. There is nothing that is over him. There is nothing that trumps his reign. He is our king. The ascension, the exaltation refers to a moment in time that consists of a departure but also a reception. In way of definition, the ascension is the removal of Jesus and his resurrected body from space and time into the immediate presence of God the Father. Similarly, by way of definition, the exaltation is the position of preeminence in heaven, in which Christ shares in the power and glory of the Father and sits at his right hand as his vice regent. As you might expect, there are blessings. There are tremendous blessings that come to Christ's people due to the ascension and the exaltation. What are they? What comes to your mind? What blessings do you receive as one of Christ's chosen because of his exaltation and because of his ascension? Yes. The ascension and exaltation marked the end of Jesus' first coming. Jesus' kenosis is over. This is Jesus setting aside certain divine attributes for a time while he lived upon this earth. Jesus' role as a suffering servant has officially ended. He is now in an exalted position. This is explained for us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22. And it states that Jesus is at the right hand of God having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. The disciples had no thought of Jesus coming back until the time when he would return to take his rightful place as a king. We know this is Christ's second coming. So the ascension and exaltation marked the end of his first coming. He is no longer that suffering servant. But the ascension and exaltation also mark the beginning of his high priestly work. Turn to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 8. Here, the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 8 verse 1. This is such a wonderful passage. Hebrews 8 verse 1. Now the main point in in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. 
For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, so it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, speaking of Jesus, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle. For see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain? Verse six, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, but as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. Christ is your high priest, is your mediator of a better covenant. The sinless life of Jesus, the God-man, his substitutionary sacrifice, his resurrection, provide us with a better covenant and a better high priest than all the others. The ascension and the exaltation mark the beginning of his high priestly work. There is an element in which he, he did function as a high priest in the high priestly prayer in John 17, but not, in, not as an exalted king. Now he is your high priest as an exalted king. But the ascension and exaltation, it guarantees that believers have an advocate at the right hand of the father. If you're still in Hebrews, turn to chapter four, verse 12. You have an advocate Hebrews chapter four, and I'm sorry, verse 15. It says this, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. You have an advocate. Hebrews 9.24 says, for Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God. Do you know what it says? For us. For you, saint. The ascension and exaltation settled the supremacy of Christ. If there was ever a question on whether or not Christ is supreme, the exaltation and ascension answers this question for us. Ephesians chapter one, verses 18 through 21, Paul says to the Ephesian church, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Again, far above all rule and authority. The ascension and exaltation settle the debate on whether or not Christ is supreme. And as it was already stated, the ascension and exaltation guarantee guarantees the promised Holy Spirit and triumph over all enemies. Do you know if there was no ascension? If there was no ascension, if Christ never left, the Holy Spirit could not come. Even if Christ was in his resurrected body. Acts 2 33 through 36 says this, just listen. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth, pour, poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself said, David himself said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And lastly, the ascension and exaltation guarantees Christ's second coming. 
As the disciples were gazing into heaven after the ascension of Christ, two men in white clothing stood beside them and said again, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking? Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come. He will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Is that good news? If Jesus Christ was never resurrected, if Jesus Christ never ascended, if he was never exalted, there would have been no Pentecost. There would be no indwelling spirit, no great works to be done by believers. There would be, there will be, no future home, no high priestly work of, or advocating work of Jesus, no triumph over the world, over the flesh, over Satan and his demons. And there would be no second coming. We often focus so much on the, crucif- the crucifixion, the crucified Christ, sometimes to the detriment of not really considering the resurrection. And I would even say, probably even more, that we forget that there is, was even such a thing as an ex- ascension and exaltation. If it weren't for these works, what would we do? Where would we go? What ability would we have? If the resurrection and ascension and exaltation are not true, we are the most hopeless of people. We are above all men the most worthy to be pitied, right? What we live for would be simply be a mirage. The message that we spread is a lie. The God whom we say we follow, it's a myth. First Corinthians 15. clarifies for us the depths of despair that we should feel if there is no resurrection. If you'd like to turn there, go to verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 13. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith also is in vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ. Did you get that? If there is no resurrection, then we're liars about God. We are spreading lies. Verse 16, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have, hope in Christ, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Many of you, have you have, as you have lost loved ones, there's a part of you that 
that can't wait because of the hope that is within you, cannot wait to see them again in glory. If there is no resurrection, Christ is not raised, there is no Savior, they are not in glory, you will never see them again. But that is not true. Christ has indeed been raised. What we live for is true. It is in fact the greatest of truths. The message we spread is the only one true saving message that provides forgiveness of sins, mercy from God's wrath, peace with God, admittance into God's church, and an eternal destiny with God our Savior forever and ever and ever. God is no myth. He is, in fact, the, really def- the real definition of all that is true. Paul's final words on the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, 42, he says this. The resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. Perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Speaking of Christ. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we also bear the image of the heavenly. There's a day coming, saints, where we will perfectly bear the image of the heavenly. We will shed this body of death. We will shed our flesh. We will take on a resurrected body that is perfectly designed to live throughout eternity forever and ever with God, rejoicing, praising, working for our King. But now, but now, There's a glimpse of the heavenly that we produce here on earth and that is when our hearts have been changed by God and we begin to live for him. We begin to do good deeds according to the salvation that we've been, been given. Again, good deeds can never precede the regenerating work of God's spirit over God's spirit in the heart. God's spirit regenerates man's hearts. He changes us. He makes us new. Good works never precede that, but they come to follow. Dear saints, we need to put that work on display for God's glory, in God's power, through his spirit. This is what's available through the gospel. The gospel is the good news. If you sit here today and you are, you know, you know at the depth of your heart, you are are, are left in your sin. That if you died at this very moment and God was to look down upon you, he could not accept you. If you know that before the eyes of an almighty God, you still bear the weight of, and wrath of God on you because of your sin, I urge you, let today be the day of salvation. There is no reason to wait. The greatest miraculous deed that God does on this planet today is transforming a human heart. One that is hateful and hating him, one that despises the truth, to one that loves him and loves the truth. 
The gospel is good news. And I hope that you've seen the blessings of the gospel are simply unending. If you sit here and you don't know, you just, you just don't know, or maybe you do know, that either you don't know you're going to heaven or you do know you're not, please let me urge you, come talk to me. Come talk to one of the elders. Let us help you work through that. But there is a God in heaven who sent his son to bear the wrath of mankind on his shoulders. Jesus lived that perfect life that we couldn't live. He died a sinner's death in our place. He, in fact, took your sin upon himself. He bore God's wrath. He allowed God, in, in, in him bearing God's wrath, when you accept and believe in the finished work of Christ, you receive Christ's righteousness. Which means that now God can be at peace with you, be your friend. God is good. And this day commemorates his resurrection. This is a glorious day. He has risen. There's no question about it. Please pray with me. Father, the work of your son, even for those of us who have understood the resurrection for years. We never get tired of hearing what it is that our Savior accomplished. Father, thank you for sending your Son to die. Thank you for sending your Son to resurrect. Thank you that in your pleasure you took your Son from this earth and you brought him to yourself. And thank you, Father, that your Son is seated to your right hand in the exalted position of preeminence as vice regent, ruling and functioning as king. We know that there is a future kingship, that there's a future ruling that will have its fulfillment in days to come. But Father... There is a risen king, and his name is Jesus Christ. Father, we give you all praise. We give you all thanks for sending your son to die for sinners such as us. May all that we do today bring you glory and honor. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.